I would like to introduce to you someone that you all know and you probably don't need introduction to. But it is my honor, again, to introduce to you shortly, Elliot Cohen, the Robert E. Osgood Professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, where he directs the Strategic Studies Program and the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies, which he founded. Mr. Cohen is the author of several books, including The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power, and The Necessity of Military Force, which he um, published in 2017. We also have with us Rosa Brooks, the Professor of Law and Associate Dean at Georgetown Law. Her most recent book is How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, published in 2016. The moderator, you've heard, you know, is Peter Bergen, a journalist, documentary producer, and vice president in New America. He's also the rec director of its International Security Future War and Fellows Program. You probably know him and heard him and see him as the CNN National Security Analyst. So without further ado, let's hear from the panel. Please come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will follow the same procedure the same protocol for questions and answers. So please line up behind the microphones and we'll uh, give you a chance to have your question asked. Please go ahead. Well, Dr. Cohen, uh, Professor Brooks. Um, so the title of the panel is Forever Wars and American National Security. So maybe just some framing observations from you and then we'll have a, a discussion. Okay. Uh, you with me. All right. So first, I just want to say it's great to be here. I've spoken at a number of the World Affairs Councils in Boston and Pittsburgh, and uh, it is a great organization. Um, so I think the title was The Forever Wars, and uh, the first point I would make is that it, it is anomalous to have wars that go on this long, as long as Iraq, Afghanistan, and the sort of a broader war with um, the violent uh, jihadists uh, uh, has. And to some extent that's a result of decisions that we've made and that other people have made, but I think to some extent that's just the nature of these conflicts. And it is hard for us to wrap our heads around that. The, the American military preference uh, is certainly, I would say, since um, the Civil War is for Pretty decisive wars with dramatic beginnings and dramatic endings. And that's just not the world that we're in. And I think to some extent we, we simply have to adjust to it. Second point I'll make is a, a framing comment and then pass the exhibit to my colleague, Professor uh, Brooks, is to say that one of the things that probably doesn't get enough attention are the, the consequences of engaging in these, uh, these conflicts, particularly the United States military. Um, when you have, for example, general officers who now have spent most of their careers one way or another engaged in these fights, it does things to how they think about all, all sorts of issues, from what the nature of military leadership is, what strategy is, uh, what civil military relations, a subject that, that Professor Rip, uh, Brooks and I have both written about, um, is all about. And so I think it may be worth spending a little bit of time kind of going under the waves a bit to think through some of those issues. Yeah. Yeah, I would second everything uh, uh, that you just said. I, I think that we, we live at a moment when the lines between war and not war, war and peace, have gotten very, very blurry. And as Elliot said, that's partly because of decisions that the U.S. government has made over several successive presidential administrations, both Democratic and Republican. And it's partly just because of the world out there and the way the world is, regardless of whether we like it or not. But that blurriness, that difficulty drawing sharp lines between war and not war, uh, has all kinds of consequences that I think we, some of which we are obvious and some of which are less obvious. Uh, it means that it's harder to draw appropriate boundaries between military and civilian. Uh, it means it's harder to apply, it's harder to figure out what what legal rules and what norms apply. Should we apply in a given situation 
the body of laws and rules associated with armed conflict, with war, uh, which are very permissive when it comes to the use of force and lethal force and coercion by states? Or should we apply the body of legal rules associated with peacetime, ordinary law, which are much more restrictive when it comes to the state use of force, much more focused on protection of individual rights and due process. If we don't know whether we're in a situation that we should count as war or a situation we should count as not war, we don't know which body of rules applies, and that creates a lot of confusion. And in, th in fact, I think in some pretty deep ways is, is threatening to the whole notion of the rule of law when you don't know what rules to apply. It also has real institutional consequences. Uh, if you think that we're always going to be sort of kind of at war mm. and you're a military leader, then you're always busy. And if you think that the war could involve threats that could be traditional weapons, bombs and tanks and armies, or it could be cyber, or it could be some kind of bioengineered virus, and it could come from a state or it could from, come from a non-state actor, then you're in the impossible position of trying to prepare to respond to threats that could take any form, come from any place, at any time, and even for an institution as large as the US military, that's not possible to do. So it creates all kinds of dilemmas, as well as the civil military dilemmas uh, that, that Elliot mentioned. But we've been here before, right? And as you've said, those are in the past, and, and also Dr. Cohen. Um, you know, the East India Company essentially took over India, it was a private company. The Dutch East India Company took over Indonesia, it was a private company. So these kinds of neat barriers between war and not war, uh, government, you know, the kind of uh, uh, surrender ceremony on the deck of a warship, I mean, that's kind of what we kind of think of as being the state of play, but in fact, maybe that was an unusual moment. Are we going back to something that was more prevalent in the past where these neat boundaries didn't exist? You know, I think we are, we are to some extent still living under the shadow of World War II and how we conceptualize it. Or even, uh, am I, can you hear me now? Okay, somebody else did something. Um, <laughs> We're trying to silence you, Elliot. But <laughs> they always fail, and they always fail. <laughs> and they always fail. Um, you know, you, some of this has to do with how we, even how we understand our own history. So, for example, I remember giving a lecture at the Army War College once. The military, of course, has these very elaborate planning processes in which they think of war in a number of phases, and phase four is post-war, you know, reconstruction, uh, governance, sort of restoring things to normal. And I remember getting one saying, you know, here at the Army War College, there are all these pictures of Robert E. Lee gazing soulfully into the eyes of Stonewall Jackson before the Battle of Chancellorsville and Pickett's Charge and all that. You know, one thing about Phase Four of the Civil War, which lasted over a century, yeah. in which the United States Army was actually deeply involved, beginning with Reconstruction, but through uh, a whole bunch of things in the 19th and 20th century. And in some ways, we only, we, well, in some ways, we're still not out of it. Yeah. So, so some of this has to do with with the real history and some of the way we frame the history for ourselves. I think that's right. And, and in, in, in some ways, the difference between the moment we're in now and 150 years ago, 300 years ago, 700 years ago, whatever moment in history you want to pick, is that we live in an era in which we believe in the power of human beings through the creation of law, through the creation of political institutions and categories, sort of control reality that way. You know, and the last, uh, you can date it about 150 years uh, back, you can date it back to the era of the American Civil War. Uh, after the Civil War, we get, we, during the Civil War, we get the, the Libra Code, uh, the first written body of rules of armed conflict. After that, we get the first Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions. But the real explosion in international lawmaking comes, as Elliot said, right after World War II. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, but prior to World War II, if you, if you were to look at a list of international treaties extant, they would count probably maybe the high hundreds. Uh, in the decades following World War II, there was just an explosion in rulemaking and an explosion in international institution creating. We, get, we not only get the United Nations Charter and the UN system itself, but we get just, you know, you pick a topic, there is a multilateral treaty on it somewhere out there, no matter how obscure the issue is. So we live in this moment where we, we told ourselves, and maybe we just sold ourselves a bill of goods, 
but we told ourselves that we could we could find a nice neat category for everything and we could create a nice solid set of rules for everything and now what we're discovering is that the particular categories and institutions we created which which worked pretty well for the world right after right after the second world war no longer fit the messy reality reality is always getting out of its box so maybe the anomaly when we look back on this moment will not be that the world is messy Maybe the anomaly would be that we, we spent a century telling ourselves that we something could else. Call it. Yeah. I, I, I would just add one other thing to that, and I completely agree with that. Um, some of this really is peculiar to the nature of these conflicts. If, God forbid, we end up in the Korean War, Second Korean War, that will look much more like yeah. war as we thought about it in World War II time, uh, in the World War II sense. You know, there'll be a dramatic beginning, it will end, uh, it will be pretty horrific, uh, but it won't be something that will drag on for 15 years. That what do you think the likelihood of that is? I think two out of five. Uh, and that's pretty high. But, yeah, that's scary. Better than three out of five, four <laughs> out of five years. Well, but, but I mean, I mean given, the, given the consequences of such a war. No kidding. Um, so, uh, and the reason why I think that is uh, first that, you know, I'm now. You don't have to say the T word. What? Are you going to say the T word? I am going to say the T word. Isaac, he's telling me that before we uh, went on, you know, sooner or later all roads lead to Trump. Um, <laughs> Well, the, the first thing is, uh, I'm now in my seventh decade of life, and uh, which is a pretty horrible thought. And as one, if there's one thing I've learned, it's to have incredible faith in the power of human stupidity mm. and, and blunder. Um, so I can easily imagine a cascade of events where you know they fire a test missile, we knock it down. They push back with, I don't know, a cruise missile or a tanker, and we say, uh, we'll up the ante, and we'll take out the missile launcher sites, and then who knows. So that's one thing. Second thing, the president has rhetorically backed himself into a much worse corner than even Obama did with the, with the red line in Syria, mm -hmm. because this is a threat directed against us, which the Syria issue is not, and he's been very, very stark, and North Korea is not going to denuclearize, and the Chinese are not going to act as our mm. sheriff. So he's sort of uh, back in. And thirdly, I think there is a body of opinion in some corners of the U.S. government that, you know, this is an intolerable threat, we really have to deal with it. And there may even be, in some corners of South Korea, uh, not uniformly, but in some corners, particularly the military, people realizing this is the last opportunity to resolve this with the alternative being a protect being a protector of the United States forever. Um, so I don't rule really anything out. At the end of the day, I think the president is sufficiently um, <laughs> cowardly, but um, I don't think he would actually have the gumption to go where one part of his heart would otherwise take it. Dr. Lee, you said a very interesting thing about, you know, it took a century for phase four after the Civil War, the American Civil War. And, and you can look at the Middle East right now and say, look, it's all really, we're still dealing with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so, A, is that sort of true? And B, um, you know, the American, the United States acts as an empire in many ways, but it's very uncomfortable with that idea. And one of the reasons we kind of keep making mistakes, I think, is you know, we're always there for six months or a year, and then we're gone, right? And we're going to be in Afghanistan for a very long time. I mean, for, because it's in our interest, their interest, and they want us to stay. So, is there something about the American psyche that prevents us from sort of just accepting the fact that we're an empire, and therefore we're going to have to do empire-like things, like learn languages, get expertise, etc.? Well, the British Empire was entirely comfortable being an empire, and it still eventually fell apart, right? So, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure that the only problem that we're facing is is our unwillingness to uh, take up the uh, the uh, imperial burden. 
Um, but I, I do think that the nature of the American political system is, is probably uniquely debilitating, not simply for, for empire, should we choose to attempt to maintain one, but, but just for any kind of longer term approach to mm. achieving our, our international security interests. Uh, I, and I don't, I'm not telling you anything you don't know when we, when we look at the, the types of gridlock uh, in Congress, when we look at the uh, lack of interest most members of the American public show in international affairs and the generally low level of knowledge about mm. foreign affairs. Uh, uh, I, I do think it's, it's probably fair to say that we're a, uni we're a nation with a uniquely short attention span, um, and that is debilitating in all kinds of ways. Well, I, I guess I, um, I think I may agree with you a bit more than that, at least in part. Uh, we are self, we have always had been self consciously you know, the first revolutionary country, the first country we, you know, we began by fighting an empire. Um, and we don't like to think of ourselves as imperial. And when you look at the, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right about the institutional adaptation. So, for example, the British Army and India, the Indian Army, run by the Brits, had an institution that was political officers. So these would be officers who would be living in Waziristan or places like that year after year after year. They'd go around and they'd address, they were fluent in not just the language, but the dialects. They knew all the tribes, they knew all the families. That is the kind of thing you do if you're going to run uh, an empire. And we, our institutions just never adapted to that. When I was at the State Department, I was always stunned at how few Pashto speakers we had. So how many were there? So this actually, I got, I got engaged on that one. Uh, I found out, uh, the great thing, I was the counselor of the State Department, so I was uh, Secretary Rice's senior advisor and but, but you have a little bit more authority than, than, than that would imply. So I, I found out. We were great deal of nine. Huh. Most of whom were janitors or computer specialists. <laughs> <laughs> they you know, were grown up speaking Pashto. So there were, uh, and we had, and, and so then I said, wow, that's not many. And, and you know, the janitors and the computer specialists are not really engaged in the effort. I said, how many do we have in the training pipeline? It was two. I said, two? I said, well, yeah, well, there's no follow-on assignments for them, you know. So it's not like the only one place in the world we're going to speak Pashto, so that, that sounds about right. And then on top of it all, uh, I used to go to the shower until they kept on blowing up the hotels I was staying at. And the, um, there was a wonderful young foreign service officer, fluent in Pashto, but that was a natural linguist, who was great. Um, and the consulate general loved him. Uh, he wanted to be up for a second tour, and of course they wouldn't let him because it was his turn to go to Paris. Mm. <laughs> so that's not, that's not imperial behavior. There are a lot of other examples I can give from uh, defense. The, the other half of it is this, that you know, I don't think any of the past three administrations has wanted to stay in the Middle East. No. You know? Bush wanted to have mission accomplished. Obama certainly wanted to get the heck out of Iraq. I, I give Trump credit for wanting to do the same and to get out of Afghanistan, and yet they're kind of stuck in the big muddy, and that which is an interesting thing. Last thing I have to say in the Middle East is what's going on right now in, in the Persian Gulf is I think we are trying to deputize Saudi Arabia and the Emirates to be our counterbalance to Iran. How's that going? I, I, I well. You would know better than that, of course, than I. Uh, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So we have this very interesting crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, as they call him. Um, you know, he's something that's very good. I mean, he clearly is taking on the religious establishment in the way we wanted Saudi leaders to do. He is, looks like he's trying to transform the Saudi governing system into a more conventional monarchy, where rather than having 30,000 princes swanning around, you have one royal family. Um, I, I find it hard, and he's taking on the Iranians. Um, I find it hard to imagine one 32 year old being able to pull all that off. Yeah. Uh, and so I think they, I can understand why we're throwing a lot in with him. Um, 
but I think the jury will be out for quite some time. So the title of the panel is Forever Wars, and you both said we're in a forever war, and you know, we're going to have to accept that, and yet the authorization for the use of military force that sort of enables these wars was passed three, you know, several days after 9-11, was directed at the people who perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. Now we're in Niger, clearly that's got nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. So, I mean, understanding that Congress is highly unlikely to take this up, but, but nonetheless that it would be good for a public discussion, similar to what we're having now, about how long is this war, how many resources should be attached, where are we fighting, who are we fighting, these basic questions. And what's your thought about, about all of that? Because it would kind of bring some clarity to this enterprise. Well, uh, both the Trump administration, the Obama administration before it, and the Bush administration before that were extremely adept at a kind of uh, legal reasoning that I would call <laughs> the, the, you know, the leg bones connected to the hip bone, the hip bones connected to the whatever bone, and the next thing you know, you know, the Niger is, in fact, part right. of the 9-11 attack, and so is Somalia, and so is everywhere else. And, and, and so I think we, we, we have seen a, a bipartisan willingness on the part of the executive branch to really play fast and loose with, with basic logic uh, when it comes to the 2001 uh, authorization to use military force. Um, I think we've also seen Congress, despite the occasional sort of, you know, upsurge of whining, uh, completely unwilling to do anything about it other than the occasional whine. And it, it is a, it's a crying shame. It's, it's, it's a, and, and, and the reality is, I don't think the American public is particularly bothered by this. Mm. My, my husband, uh, we were talking earlier before we got on, uh, on, up on stage here about my, my husband who retired a couple of years ago as an Army Special Forces officer. And, and he is uh, quite cynical <laughs> after 25 years uh, uh, in the Army. And, and, and his, his, his response to that, of course, would be to say, what's not to love about the forever war? If you're the military, what's not to love? Um, people, you know, very few yeah. people die, at least Americans. Uh, some do, but mm -hmm. most don't. Um, compared to our previous wars, these are pretty safe wars for us overall, statistically speaking. Your career can be made, you get your, you get your combat patch, uh, you get mm -hmm. command opportunities in combat situations. This is great for military officers, this is great for the military industrial complex, military security complex. This is great for members of Congress who, who have those as, as lobbyists and funders and constituents and so forth. Uh, this works for everybody except possibly people somewhere else, uh, and that there's just really no structural incentive whatsoever, either from within the military or from within Congress or coming from the American public to say we need to do something about it because it's, it's not impinging on us as a nation in the way World War II or even Vietnam did. Uh, so there's no particular reason to think it's going to change. I, you know, I completely agree with that, but I would take it a step darker, maybe two steps darker. Um, this, is, you know, this is part of a pattern of Congress ceding its authority to the executive. It's mm -hmm. the same reason why you don't have senatorial confirmation of treaties. Mm -hmm. It's the same reason why the ratification of treaties. Mm -hmm. um, that's how the system is supposed to work, and yes, it's painful. Uh, and, and difficult, but that is how it is supposed to work. And the Senate has been willing to kind of let that go. The executive branch all too happy to get away with it. Um, it this is also part of a pattern of the expansion of the power of the presidency. And I think one of the good things about the current moment is it does make people think a little bit. Do we want to have a chief, chief executive with the kind of power that they've now been invested with first during the Cold War, and then during these conflicts. And, um, but above all, it's, you know, it, it, there is something shameful that, you know, there isn't one of the sense of, you know, the norms of Republican small r governments that the people's representatives are supposed to speak on this. It, it's not just supposed to be a presidential decision. Yeah. Which raises a question about continuities and discontinuities between you know, Bush, Obama, and Trump, because, I mean, on the surface, they're all very different. But I think, and what, 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 are, you, and what are the continuities that you see? 
I, I do think that when it comes to the expansion of executive power, there are more continuities than discontinuities. Uh, I think the, the only difference between the administrations is sort of their, their level of comfort with openly acknowledging that. I think I mm. think that the Republicans have tended to be more comfortable just saying, hey, yeah, uh, we're expanding executive power. You have a problem with that? Whereas President Obama sort of felt a little guilty about it, you know, would occasionally <laughs> say things like, well, you know, the There's a constitutional rule that gets right. Law professor, <laughs> this presents difficult issues. We're going to, as a matter of policy, but 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 no, I, I think I think from that perspective that there has been much more continuity than, than anything else, and I think it's it's understandable, right? If if you are remember what what I said at the very beginning of this discussion about one 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 consequence of the blurring of the boundaries between what counts as war and what counts as not war, peace, ordinary ordinary times. Uh, is that we don't know which set of legal rules to apply. The body of legal rules, both domestically in this country under U.S. law and internationally under international law, relating to war and national security matters more broadly, gives the executive a lot more latitude than the body of legal rules, human rights law internationally, or, or, uh, or just ordinary criminal law, et cetera. Uh, and so if you're the executive and your advisors are coming to you and they're saying, um, look, we've got a choice. We could choose to conceptualize threat A, which could be maybe it's terrorist attack, maybe it's maybe the threat is cyber, whatever it is. We could choose to conceptualize it in in the framework of war and armed conflict and national security threat, in which case you have enormous latitude to do whatever you want with almost no judicial oversight, et cetera, et cetera. Or we could choose to conceptualize it not in that basket labeled war, in which case there's going to be a ton of judicial oversight. Everybody's going to be suing you. It's going to be really difficult. Your hands are going to be tied. What do you prefer? Hmm. <laughs> Gee, I think I'll take basket A war. You know, that looks better to me because you're always going to choose the, the option that gives you greater flexibility. And you're always going to think, I'm a good guy. I'm not going to misuse this power. Uh, and I and I do think we are at an interesting moment if we, you know, refer to he who must not be named um, begins with T, rhymes with ump. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that has, I think, it, it has in a really interesting way raised some questions about, whoa, you know, we've had a series of presidents who said, yes, I see that executive power is expanding, but that's, don't worry, because I'm a really responsible guy, you know, and you can trust me. Uh, and President Bush said that, and President Obama said that. And in many ways, I think most of us thought, all right, you know, we may not agree with you on everything, but we basically can trust you. And now we're at a moment when I think that the challenges to sort of accepted norms about political behavior are so great that we do have members of the Senate raising questions like, huh, about that nuclear button, hmm. Uh, so, so it is a really interesting moment, and I, and I do think that although there are some real dangers right now, that we also are at a moment where there's greater, I'm not going to say likelihood of change uh, and, and restrictions on executive power in the next five to ten years, maybe not likelihood, but greater possibility perhaps than we've, than we've had at any time in the previous two decades or so. You know, I, I think um, every, Bob Gates talks about this in his uh, memoirs, since he was Secretary of Defense after all, under both Bush and Obama. But, and, and he had seen many transitions before that. And the absolute norm is that the new team comes in saying, our predecessors were simply a gang of idiots. <laughs> and I mean, the Bush team did that with the Clinton people. I can tell you, since I was there, the Obama people certainly uh, felt that way about uh, uh, the Bush people, Trump, uh, the Trump people with the Obama people. They end up doing a lot of the same things. Um, so you could say, well, structurally, there's a lot of continuity. So, for example, the initial Obama Afghan strategy was the strategy that a whole bunch of us had helped draft at the end of the Bush uh, uh, presidency, led by the same guy, Doug Root, who, uh, who stayed on. But, but there is a problem. And the problem is, first, with an administration self conception. If you think that, you know, this is just us who have achieved these successes, but there's a good chance you're going to misunderstand the world. So I was talking to one of the few people in the Trump administration who will still speak with me on occasion. <laughs> I have literally had people run in the opposite direction. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I am not making that up. I'm not making that up. Um, so he was insistent that, you know, the destruction of 
the Islamic State's physical footprint in Iraq that was entirely the doing of the Trump administration. Had nothing to do with Barack Obama. I said, well, General John Allen, who designed that campaign <laughs> win under Obama, might have a different view. Uh, but that was his take. And the problem was that that was going to distort his understanding of how effective they were and, and what they were doing. The second thing I'd say is, the structure of what's going on may be similar, but the mood music, of course, is very different. It's the style of rhetoric and how you present yourself. And it, it's in the nature of foreign policy, I believe, that um, the mood music on occasions can actually be very important about what it says to the rest of the world about the nature of your credibility and your commitment, your stability, your predictability. So the mood, mood music matters, even if the structure seems relatively the same. You, you're uh, one of the leaders of the Republican ever Trump movement. Right. I mean, do you feel sort of vindicated by, or are you, or has your views changed, or I, I take it from your body language that that was a stupid question. No, I, I, mean, I, I left the Republican Party the week after the election, um, but I feel completely vindicated in every last word I've written. Here's another sort of just on all subjects, but the <laughs> <laughs> um, you know technology is also driving you know uh, about what Rose has written about this boundary between war and peace is sort of you know kind of disappearing the forever wars that is the subject of this panel. So armed drones allow a president of uh, whatever party to do things that were unimaginable before 9/11. Cyber warfare, similarly, um, and they raise some sort of interesting questions. Uh, but how do you, I mean, how has that changed the nature of sort of warfare and, and also the nature of presidential power, in a sense? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. I think we're still trying to figure that out. But, but one of the things that I find most fascinating, right, think about, think about our traditional understanding of what counts as war, right? Think of Clausewitz, right? We think that war is something that involves physical force, uh, that if you don't end up with dead bodies, or at least bloody bodies, it's not war. That you have to have a lot of them, not just a few of them. It's not individualized, it's mass, it's organized, it's for a political purpose. Uh, one of the things that has happened uh, as a result of technological developments, whether you want to look at cyber, uh, the, the whether you want to look at uh, semi-autonomous uh, technologies and artificial intelligence, or the rise of big data in conjunction with all of these things, um, and around the corner evolutions in nanotechnology, biotechnology, increasingly there exist technologies to coerce and control, to disrupt, to coerce and control that don't require large numbers of dead bodies lying around. And on the one hand, that's a good thing, right? Um, I mean, 60 million people dead in World War II or whatever the number is, and we'll never really know. Um, if there are technologies that enable conflict and contestation between states and non-state actors that don't need us to have 60 million dead bodies, that's surely a good thing on some level. And yet I also think the consequences for democracy and for democratic control are potentially somewhat chilling. Um, you know, one theory of uh, the rise of democracy holds that, to oversimplify radically, uh, that you get advances in democracy advances in, in human rights, uh, extension of the suffrage, and so on, uh, when you live in an era of history in which forms of warfare in, require lots of manpower. In other words, if, you, if you're an elite and you are, your survival is threatened unless you can get the masses to fight on your behalf, you've got to be nice to the masses. You've got to say things like, oh, sure, you can vote. You know, or, oh, sure, you can have those human rights that you've been asking for. Uh, during periods of human history when warfare was not dependent on, on manpower, uh, when you know, high, other, other technologies, the longbow or whatever, temporarily displace mass armies, that you see more of a retreat. Uh, so as we shift increasingly to another moment in which you, as, as whether you're the president of the United States or whether, or whether you're a leader of some other state, uh, in which you can achieve the ends that warfare is traditionally designed to achieve. You can obtain your political objective, you can attain power, dominance, control of resources, etc., without having to get a lot of human beings to agree to risk their lives for it. 
uh, that you don't have to be nice to human beings anymore. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to make those trade-offs anymore. You can get yeah. your way without them. Uh, and, and, and I do think that that's part of the trend that we've been talking about, the rise of executive power and American public that's largely tuned out. When we can achieve, or well, or not, I question whether we're achieving, but whether, when we can tell ourselves that we can achieve our political objectives through things like targeted drone strikes and so forth, and we don't need to say to American uh, citizens, hey, your sons or daughters are the ones who are going to have to put their lives on the line, um, they're going to tune out. Uh, the government's not going to think they have to care about what they want anymore uh, because they're not asking them for sacrifices. So, so it's, it doesn't make me think, I don't think the, the answer to this is what we need for democracy is a nice good war in which millions of people are dying. That's clearly not the answer. But I do think it poses a real conundrum when we think about the future. Yeah, I, I, once again, I agree. Um, one of the ways the technologies can take you to places uh, without really thinking about it, that you might not have ever thought you would go. So, for example, there's, there's nothing new about assassination. Mm -hmm. right? It was pretty old. Um, but, but it's hard to pre remember now that George Shultz, as Secretary of State, opposed a CIA plan to assassinate Abu Nidal, who was a very bad guy, mm -hmm. uh, head of uh, Black September. On the ground, the United States doesn't do assassination. Yeah. Uh, now, by the way, instead, he, 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 we don't want to use the Saddam Hussein, and he died in Baghdad of suicide. <laughs> it, a very curious suicide. Yes. He, he had two bullets in his head. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a really quick trigger, tra uh, trigger finger, I think. Um, but, you know, and instead, we're now in a world where President Obama, you know, a nice guy liberal, if ever there was one, has ordered the assassination of thousands of people. Almost all of them completely deserve it. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but but it's that's a place that you never would have thought we would go. I think the second thing is to build on on what uh, Richard was saying. It's much easier to get opaque war. I mean, I think that's one of the things about cyber. Uh, where I mean, this gets very technical very quickly, but issues of attribution: who exactly is doing what? How deliberate? Mm -hmm. Who are the actors? That becomes a lot murkier, and that that very much complicates the politics of this all. Um, I think I'll disagree somewhat in that I think war does end up being about the, the element of violence is distinctive because once you're killing people or really destroying things on a substantial scale, I think as human beings we react differently, even then if you know money disappears from some account or. All of a sudden, I can't turn on my computer. It's, it's, I think it's in a different place. The last thing I'll say is, to some extent, this is the nature of our wars. Um, but I have often thought recently that we're, we're not in a different place in part because the generation, we no longer have with us the generation for whom the 1930s and World War II is a living memory. So we don't know how bad it can get. And although I think we're unlikely, to have a, a World War II kind of war. People have been slinging nuclear weapons around. So my last question before opening, That's what you're going to get. Before opening of the audience, in your new book, uh, Professor Cohen, you, you kind of take Stephen Pinker to task, who wrote an you know, influential book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, essentially making the claim that you know, we're kind of getting nicer and wars are less likely and less people are dying and we're kind of on a trajectory to uh, not quite world peace, but something that looks much better than anything we've seen in the rearview mirror. You're not getting nicer. Speak for yourself, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, is any of that true? Because I totally accept uh, that I'm not getting nicer, and um, and I'm a Catholic, so original sin is kind of a useful kind of uh, kind of uh, way of looking at the world. And I mean, I think so. Is Pinker right? No, I, I think Pinker. Well, I think he's partly right. I mean, uh, you know, the, the Canadians are not going to be sponsoring Indian roads <laughs> into northern New York anymore. They've given up on that. Uh, more seriously, it's quite unlikely that the Germans and French will decide that you know Verdun was so much fun that they'll do it again. Yeah. Um, but I think he is wrong in that everything that in that it well, was a very interesting and sophisticated book, and I, I really try to be fair to it in, yeah. in my book. Um, it is an interesting and sophisticated book, but what he, there, there are two things about it. First, he could have said almost exactly the same things in 1900. Mm. And so for the book to be completely convincing, the world wars have to be blips, but they're probably not blips. 
Uh, at least I don't think they're blips, and if they are blips, then the blips are more interesting than the, the, uh, the trends. The second thing is, it's very curious. He gives multiple explanations for why we are, why the world is in some ways a more peaceful place. The one explanation that I would have put forward uh, that he does not is that since 1945, the United States has played a very large role in the world, and a very important role in stabilizing the world and maintaining order. And so perhaps statecraft had something to do with this as well. That is the one explanation mm. that, that he just doesn't deal with at all. And I actually think statecraft's important. No, I, I agree with Elliot. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of Pinker's claims, uh, in part because I think uh, anything that rests on an analysis of trends post-World War II uh, makes some assumptions about our ability to predict the future and, and the likelihood that a trend of 70 years means something for 100 years from now or even, even 20 years from now. You know, in the, in, the, in the sweep of human history, it's the blink of an eye. Um, and I, I, you know, I, 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 you were asking about, uh, uh, we, we raised the issue of the use of nuclear weapons. I, I'm constantly stunned when I hear people say things to me like, well, you know, we've gone for 70, 75 years without a nuclear catastrophe. That shows that we've learned how to manage these weapons. And I think, are you kidding? It shows that we haven't blown ourselves up yet. That's all it shows, unfortunately. Right. Well, with that, we have about 15 minutes for question and answers. I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions. We'll start on the right this time. Please introduce yourself and pose your question as short as possible. Sky Forrester, uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, I started my uh, military career in Southeast Asia, which is now, I think, the short war of the 60s. It used to be called the long war of the 60s. But that war ended because there was a draft and because it was a political mandate to say, we're not going to do this anymore. And since then, there was an aversion to the use of military force, but after Desert Storm, that seems to have reversed. You've already touched on the institutions that make it, you know, the likelihood this isn't going to change. But I'd like to ask you to think about the civil military relationship and the role specifically of the military in policymaking that you both have written about, particularly since our White House Chief of Staff has now made a point about the 1% feeling very sorry for the 99% who didn't get a chance to do all that. That is the question. Hi, Sky. Um, this is a problem. I mean, it, it's, um, the first thing I'd stipulate is we're not going to go back to a draft. I um, mean, just said the practical problems associated with it are so enormous that it, it's a non-starter. There is a problem with having a military that is, really does feel somewhat detached from the rest of society, uh, that is increasingly a family business. So much of the, the power and the pay of that moment was uh, General Kelly talking about his own son, which he does not like to do, and, but, but that clearly is shaping what, what I thought was an inappropriate way of handling the journalist in that room. Um, and in a way, it puts a, it's, I suppose it puts a further burden on the military, but it puts a burden on the rest of us, too, to ensure that there are connections. One reason why I've been very militant about the importance of having ROTC on as many elite campuses as possible, which, by the way, the military doesn't always want, because it's not particularly economical, and those kids can be a problem, and all that. You want a military that is somehow linked uh, to your society, and that will be the elites that are serving in the military are the same elites that are going to be running the country's businesses and universities and newspapers and that. The British are actually very self-conscious about that, about how they go about officer recruitment for, for just that uh, for just that reason. Um, I think this will be a larger subject, and I'm not sure would like to speak to it. I think there's a bit, there is an issue here. And that so much of the foreign policy decision making leaders in this administration are military or former military. I think that is potentially quite a distorting, um, uh, that could be a very distorting thing, even though in another way I'm glad that some of them are there. Yeah, I, I have similarly mixed feelings about that issue because on the one hand, do I think it's good to have so many policy decisions in the hands of uh, current or former uh, senior military personnel? In the abstract, no, but in the non-abstract, it's always, well, compared to what? Uh, you know, if it's Jim Mattis versus Steve Bannon, uh, 
that's not a hard one for me, right? Um, <laughs> and I don't think necessarily that that pattern endures beyond this administration. Um, on the on the broader issue, um, I very much second what Elliot said that the the, the so-called civil military divide, which I think is somewhat overstated to begin with, and the significance of it is somewhat overstated to begin with. Um, it's it's entirely a product of, of things that we can change, and you don't need the draft to change them. Um, that we make decisions about where to locate bases. Uh, we make them, you know, basically based on economics. If we decide that it's important to us right. to have a military, you know, there's nothing inherent about being in the military that makes you politically conservative or that makes southerners more likely to go into the military or anything like that. This is entirely a product of the decisions that we have made and the decisions we have admitted to make where we are spending priorities, where we want to put our recruiting money, where we want to put bases, where we want to put our ROTC. If we decide that we want to have an all-volunteer military, even one that's much smaller than it is now, but that we want it to look much more like the nation as a whole, we can do that if we're willing to spend some money and make some changes in how we recruit and so forth. Uh, it's it's a choice to have a military that looks the way the military currently looks. Before we go to the left, uh, I would just say that Peter is also available to answer questions. You don't need to address only the two panelists. All three are actually uh, ready to answer your questions. Great, go ahead. Thank you, and an excellent panel. Uh, Ronan O'Malley from the World Affairs Council of Houston. Uh, Peter and Rosa, have uh, both of you before. Great to see you again. Thank you for coming. My, my initial question was sim somewhat related to what he had asked, but Elliot, you kind of already addressed the issue that you would not be in favor of any form of a draft coming again, and Rosa and Peter, not sure if you'd agree. But with such a kind of disassociated American populace with regards to foreign policy, I think that's a lot of what us here with the World Affairs Council has tried to do is get people engaged and think about what's going on in the world. Would you be in favor of some form of national service, whether it's domestic service, to get people engaged and, and working with the governments or thinking about the governments? I mean, I think whether it's Bush or Obama, when it comes to the heightened of executive powers, it was basically if the people had pushed back and Congress had pushed back from what they heard from constituents, they wouldn't be able to do it. How, what would you, the three of you, suggest for, for basically all of us to help people get more engaged? And how, how can we get the populace in general more engaged? So, so I'll just uh, start off, and I'm, I'm a little bit leery of what I'm about to say, given that I'm sitting next to a very prominent lawyer. But, um, <laughs> so let me speak first to uh, the issue of national service. Um, you know, if you think about it, in a free society, when does government get to say, I want your service, not your money? And we all know that government can take your money. But no, I want your service. And the answer tradition is, in this country, there are really only two cases. One is to defend the country, and the second is to administer justice. Right? We, we get conscripted for jury duty. Conscription, because we think it's good for your soul, uh, I think would run, I would suspect, would run into a constitutional challenge because it's, it's not education, uh, really. It's, it's, you're doing something else. As a practical matter, by the way, it also would just be utterly impossible. Millions of disgruntled kids coming in for a year, you know, emptying bedpans, and the bedpan emptying union wouldn't go berserk because you're going to have all this cheap labor driving them out of business. So I think, as a practical matter, I, you know, voluntary schemes or Teach for America, all those sorts of things, Peace Corps, I think are, are wonderful, and you want to see those uh, done robustly, but I think you want them to be done on a volunteer basis. But to your larger question, this is why I think your organization is critically important, um, and why I think it, it is, and it's so important, not only to have World Affairs Councils all over this country, but to get those of us who do spend all our time thinking and teaching and writing about foreign affairs and national security issues, out into the country and get us out of Washington or New York or Boston or uh, Palo Alto uh, and talk to as many Americans as possible and, and, and engage them. So I think actually a large part of this falls quite appropriately on, on uh, you folks and I'm glad that you're stepping forward to do it. Uh, I think you could dramatically expand voluntary national service opportunities and, and here's a and legal question you raised, fascinating one. I'm not sure I agree but but 
but it's, a, it's because in some ways we actually do think jury service is good for your soul, right? And women argued for the right to serve in juries precisely because it was a privilege of citizenship as well as an obligation. So I think it's complicated, but, but I don't think you have to go there, right? I think that you could imagine a much, a much expanded national service scheme that was voluntary. And here's, I mean, let me be a little provocative. Think about the Defense Department's budget and think about the percentage of that DOD budget that, that we probably don't need to be spending money on. Think about, think about how every year Secretaries of Defense say to Congress, why are you forcing us to fund this stupid thing that we don't need, that is it actually wasteful, destructive, useless, et cetera? <laughs> if you think about it, some fairly large chunk of the Pentagon's budget, I don't know whether we want to call it 10% or 15 or 20%, but somewhere in there um, is essentially the equivalent of agricultural subsidies, right? Paying farmers not to produce crops. They're basically job creation programs. We're funding stuff not because the nation needs it, not because the military needs it, but because enough members of Congress say, oh, if you kill that program, all my constituents would be upset because they need to make submarines in Groton or they need to do whatever, uh, et cetera. So we are already spending billions of taxpayer dollars to create jobs. The depressing thing is that we're creating jobs that aren't useful. They're not an investment in our collective future. You know, imagine if some of that money was redirected towards creating jobs that the nation does need, whether it's in infrastructure development or emptying bedpans or whatever it might happen to be, or Peace Corps-like things, teaching, you name it. Uh, imagine we use that money in a way that really was both a job creation program, I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm a liberal, and I'm cool with job creation programs, I'm cool with being taxed for them, um, you know, but also was a real investment in the future of a generation, an investment in our own infrastructure, an investment in our education system. I would love to see that, and I would love to see organizations like this start pushing political leaders to take that more seriously and to work to actually develop viable options for that. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to the right there. All right, Mary Mendoza, World Boston. Uh, Senator Berkeley was here earlier, and he said basically that he'd met with some tribal leaders who said they really didn't want us here in Afghanistan. That being said, how do we get ourselves out of this forever state of war, which is costing us trillions of dollars, which we may not necessarily pay for, but it will fall to our children and grandchildren to pay in the form of a national debt? I think there's a question for Peter Bergen. I think so, too. <laughs> no, for all, all three of you, how do we get out of this forever state of war which is costing tons of money? As a factual matter, the Asia Foundation uh, polls Afghans every year in a massive poll. I think it's 35,000 people. And, and Afghans, in large majorities, want international forces to stay to help their Afghan national army and Afghan national police. Uh, so that's just sort of a fact. Um, you know, we, I think we will be in Afghanistan for a long time because it's in our interests, it's in Afghan interests, and Afghans want us to stay. Um, and there's a reason that President Obama, President Bush, and President Trump, all very different people, have basically come to the same conclusion. And we've run a kind of controlled experiment of what leaving Afghanistan looks like, which is when we left Iraq at the end of 2011. Uh, we also have run another version of this experiment when we, left, we closed our embassy in Afghanistan in 1989 after the Soviets withdrew. Uh, the, there was a civil war, then the Taliban, and then Al-Qaeda, and then 9-11. So I think we kind of know from history what just washing our hands of it looks like. That isn't to say that we didn't waste a tremendous amount of money there, um, and that's true. Uh, however, that doesn't sort of undercut the basic point, which is uh, we should be there. And yeah, one final observation, South Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world at the end of the, North, uh, of the war with North Korea in 1953. It's now one of the richest, and that's under an American national security umbrella, and it gets back to this question of empire. The fact is, we do have sort of empire-like, it may not be the right noun, but maybe it's a kind of coalition or alliance building enterprise or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but and I'm going to get, uh, and Professor Cohen is exactly right. You know, maybe the reason that we've had stability since 1945 is the American security umbrella, of which Afghanistan is one small part. Yeah, I, I, I agree, I think. I, I think it's partly about recalibrating our assumptions and expectations. Uh, if our framework for war is that they need to have you know, a beginning and an end, uh, and that there needs to be victory mm -hmm. or defeat, and that's how they end, uh, then we have a problem. Uh, on the other hand, if, 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 I, if I say to you the same reason we've had troops in, in South Korea for decades, um, uh, you know, maybe it makes sense to have a certain number of troops in Afghanistan for decades, not because we're gonna win, not because we're gonna, 
you know, once and for all, defeat the Taliban, defeat ISIS, defeat all their friends, all the forces of evil, and then we all go home. But because we need to keep some minimum level of, of troops there to help ensure minimum stability, to keep things from getting horrifically worse for our own sake and for the sake of our Afghan partners, I'm, I'm okay with that. But, but then I do think, number one, I would like Congress to say that's what we're doing. Uh, number two, I think that you have a different legal framework that you want to apply to situations like that that are more stability operations with occasional uses of force than, than offensive action. Um, so I don't think, I think as a nation we're still not very good at, at tolerating ambiguity. We want things to be war or not war. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think we're in that world. I think that the, the difficult challenges will not be should we keep troops in some place for a really, really long time. The problem will be which troops, which places to do specifically which things. That I don't think we have a really great answer to. And I, and I, and I think I, w I don't envy senior military leaders the challenge of trying to figure out how you operate in a world where, where there's so much uncertainty. Uh, you know, where do you prioritize? Even the U.S. military, an enormous organization, we can't have people everywhere doing everything. It's not possible. Uh, so I think we face enormous challenges in figuring out how to do that. But the, I can't see all of the geopolitical trends that have brought us to where we are, both in Afghanistan and elsewhere. I don't think they're going to change. And I, I, I wish I thought that there was some moment where all the troops can come home, the war is over, but I don't. Yeah, I'm, I don't have a huge amount to add to that other than to say that um, just in terms of having a sense of perspective about how much we're spending, the, these wars are not eating up like 50% of the defense budget. They're more like about 10% more or less of the defense budget uh, or, or, or even less than that. So I mean, that's still it's a huge amount of money. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is actually you know, defense as a percentage of our gross domestic product has been going pretty steadily down. I mean, actually too far down in, in, in my judgment. Uh, and so as unsatisfactory as it is, uh, I completely agree with uh, uh, what Peter and Rose have said. It, it makes, it's not great to be there, but it makes sense to be there. And, I, and it is very striking that three very, very different presidents with very, very different predispositions have all come to the same conclusion. Hmm. Thank you. If you keep your question short, we have time for two more questions, so please keep it short. We go to the left. Sorry. Um, Sabria Fountain from the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. Um, my question is for all of you. Um, I, during, given the discussion here, um, I kind of couldn't help but think about just war theory. Um, so for me personally, do you believe that given the current administration, um, that they are willing to even follow these <laughs> Um, steps um, before the end of, well, before they get to actual warfare or war. So. That's for you, Rosa. A little bit controversial, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in this administration. Um, I do think that we have, uh, I think the best thing that I can come up with to say is that we have seen a trend of very bellicose rhetoric from the president. Um, not followed up by equally bellicose action, and to my mind, most of the time so far, that's a really good thing. Uh, and we also <laughs> clearly have seen a trend in which there's bellicose rhetoric from the president, and many members of his own uh, administration kind of follow around after him saying, no, 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 uh, and then he backs off. Um, so I, I sincerely hope that, that his, uh, instincts towards unbridled aggression will continue to uh, either be checked by, by wiser heads within his administration or that he will continue to simply uh, uh, be distracted by the next bright shiny object. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, but, but do I think that he spends a lot of his time thinking about just war theory? No, I do not. Same. This is a factual matter. You know, Trump has not sent any prisoners to Guantanamo. He said they've all gone for federal criminal trials. Uh, he has not restarted coercive interrogations. Um, I mean, and the, you know, the military has pretty strong rules of engagement about preventing civilian deaths. Civilian deaths have gone up under 
Trump, and you know, that's probably because of the pace of operations in Iraq and Syria, but it gets back to some of these questions of continuity between presidents. There's usually a lot more continuity than they say, than is said rhetorically. So, yes, uh, all, I'll stipulate that uh, all that is true. And to some extent, this is the deep state at work, and as somebody who works at a, <laughs> somebody who works at a place which uh, one of my former students described as deep state you, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is kind of what we are. I, I should say that I do a podcast with several colleagues that it's called Deep State Radio. Yeah. <laughs> I encourage you all to listen. But, but, but I think uh, one shouldn't underestimate the, the danger of corrosive things happening over a long time. Where, because, you know, the president gets to pick people, and people are policy, and norms can be eroded in that way. Um, secondly, I think, you know, it's, I worry about the president's aggressiveness, but there are also times when I worry about his ability to fold. Uh, and that may be almost as dangerous in some cases. Thank you. One more question, we're going to the right. The last question. Yes, my name is Ed Martins, I'm from World Boston, and my question goes back to something you said about the rise of technology. How much of a danger do you see coming from non-state actors? You know, 20, 25 people get their hands on a, a nuclear weapon or even a dirty bomb. How much of a threat comes from that and what can we do to stop it? Thank you. Excellent speech, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that is an issue. One of the reasons why the, uh, look, the, you know, the president's not making up the North Korean problem. And part of the North Korean problem is not just North Korean nuclear weapons under North Korean control, but they're perfectly capable of selling or giving those things to other people. And so that, I think, is, is quite worrisome. And then, of course, there are things which are sort of non-state, but sometimes allied with states. And I would just point to WikiLeaks, which at this point, if it's not a self-consciously operated arm of uh, Russian intelligence, is certainly collaborating with them and being used as a tool by them. And I think that's part of the nature of the, the threat environment that you're moving into, where it's not just, you know, a bunch of hacker, uh, you know, three or four hackers sitting around in their underwear in uh, their, their parents' basement, uh, taking down the entire American electrical grid, uh, but non-state people are working with state people. And I think it poses particular challenges to all of our assumptions about deterrence. Um, uh, I think our theories of deterrence for state actors are already questionable and uh, but when you you know most state actors we, we know where to find them we know where North Korea is if we want to threaten North Korea we can find it uh, we can call them on the phone and say here's what we're going to do if you don't do this or that when it comes to non-state actors when the, the issues of attribution uh, the issues just associated with figuring who did what and where are they and and what do they hold dear that we have the ability to threaten it, it really makes it impossible to apply traditional deterrence theory, and I, I don't think we've figured out an, an answer to that. You know, terrorist groups um, have not really engaged in kind of a, trying to acquire weapons of mass destruction in any meaningful way. ISIS had a Cobalt 60 in its possession in Mosul University and didn't even know what it was. They could have turned that into a radiological bomb. So, so terrorists are not particularly sophisticated, and they do, they, they do the things that terrorists have traditionally done. Um, but I think Elliot and, and Moser are right. I mean, the, the question is proxy forces that really are sort of fronts for states, which is a little bit different than a non, real non-state actor like ISIS. And I, so we do need to be concerned about that. But terrorist groups in general, there have been 420 jihadi terrorism cases in the United States since 9-11. Not one of them involved anything to do with chemical, biological, radiological weapons. Um, the people who are actually experimenting with these weapons are actually right-wing terrorists in this country. Uh, and again, even if they sort of deployed them, they would not necessarily be weapons of mass destruction. They would be bad, but not a classic weapon of mass destruction. Thank you to the audience for great questions. Thank you to this excellent panel. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Peter. A big round of applause.